I, I just want to say we're so passionate about classic movies. We're going to expand the conversation. You can see the passion that's in this room. It's thrilling to the core. Put a new spin on some vintage films. It's classic movies and more. Hi, I'm Rama Daska from Classic Movies and More. We're in the Bronx. We're taking a tour of Woodlawn Cemetery with the Bronx historian himself, Lloyd Olin. Let's go take a look at it. Hi, I'm Rob Madaska from Classic Movies and More, and we're back with the Bronx Borough historian himself, Mr. Lloyd Olten. He's going to take us on a tour of Woodlawn Cemetery here in the Bronx. I will pass it over to him, literally the torch, and we'll get started on our tour. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Woodlawn Cemetery is uh, 400 acres in size, so it's, it's rather huge. Um, it started with, the, um, with an idea from a Presbyterian minister in Manhattan named Absalom Peters. Uh, in those days, before the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, wealthy people from northern Manhattan, today Midtown, uh, if their loved ones died, had to go through chaotic traffic, and then when they got to uh, the East River in order to go to Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, uh, they had to transfer the coffin to a uh, to a boat and then retransfer it on the other side. And uh, he thought that this was not very dignified. Uh, as a result, he got together with a group of people uh, called the Woodlawn Cemetery Association to establish this cemetery here. He bought two farms. And the idea was that it was supposed to be a landscape cemetery so that it would be uh, almost like a rural area where people could go. Um, it opened up uh, officially in, uh, in 1965. The first person buried here was a local woman named Phoebe Underhill which I find very interesting that the name Underhill was the name of the first person buried here. Uh, ironic, that, right? I, very ironic. Uh, but I think that the, uh, uh, the, what put Woodlawn Cemetery on the map uh, occurred five years later in, uh, in 1870 uh, when uh, David Farragut, who was a Civil War hero, naval hero, and who later became the first admiral in the United States Navy, uh, died, and his funeral cortege went from Manhattan up here. Now, his very good friend, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, um, followed the cortege here, but so did the people that Grant worked with, because at that time, Grant was the president of the United States, and the vice president and every single member of the cabinet followed the funeral cortege here, and thus David Farragut is buried here, and uh, that put Woodlawn Cemetery on the map. It became the place for wealthy people to, uh, to be buried. And uh, in behind us is uh, one example of this. Uh, this is the mausoleum of Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont and his wife, Alva Smith Vanderbilt Belmont. Uh, you get the idea they had some money? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, yes. It's nicer than my house. Yeah. Now, the story actually starts with Alva, who was actually born in New Orleans before... Uh, the Civil War, and uh, when the Civil War broke out, Mama took her over to France, and she grew up in, in, in Paris, and she just fell in love with French architecture, French food, everything French. When she came back, uh, she married uh, uh, William Vanderbilt, and uh, they moved to New York, and she became the doyen of New York society. Everybody had to go to her parties. Uh, However, she was a party animal and he was not. They eventually drifted apart and they divorced. Now, this was highly unusual because people didn't divorce in those days, especially uh, the upper crust. Um, but uh, so Mrs. Astor decided to take advantage of it to become the doyen of New York society and she threw a party. Now, Alva decided to throw a party at the exact same time. And the question was, which party are you going to go to? Well, most of them went to Alva's party, and so she remained a doyen of New York society. And because of that, divorce became acceptable in the upper crust. Now, she later married Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont, and uh, he died before she did. And so uh, she built this mausoleum for him. Now, the mausoleum is an exact replica of uh, a, uh, the chapel of uh, Saint Hubert or Saint Hubert at Amboise in the Loire Valley of France, uh, and if you notice the uh, the decorations uh, starting at the uh, 
at the top, you see the Virgin Mary, and on one side is uh, King Charles the Seventh of uh, of France, and on the other side is his wife uh, Anne of Brittany. And the arms of France and Brittany are behind each one of the figures. Uh, below that, uh, there is a, a tableau. Uh, in the center, you find a stag uh, with the cross between uh, its antlers that was discovered by Saint Hubert or Saint Hubert uh, in a forest. Uh, and over on the left, uh, there is St. Christopher carrying Christ, uh, the young Christ, uh, across the, uh, uh, the pond. Uh, in, uh, so that's the, uh, the story of the decoration. Now, after uh, uh, Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont died, uh, Alva became very involved in the suffragette movement, and she actually uh, funded it. Uh, she had the dough, <laughs> the, the, per the bread, the... Uh, the money. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, she became a very important suffragette. Uh, in 1920, when women finally got the right to vote, a lot of reporters went up to her and said, uh, uh, Mrs. Belmont, now that you've won the vote, uh, who are you going to vote for for president? And she said, I'm not going to vote at all. And they said, what? You spent all this time trying to get the vote and you, uh, you're not going to vote at all? She says, yeah. Well, why? And they said, well, no woman is running. Uh, now, of course, the uh, today, huh? uh, yeah, the uh, the result of that, if she if she if, if she if she were around today, she would have the possibility of voting for a woman in the uh, from a major political party, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, when she did die in 1932, there was a huge funeral cortege of uh, former suffragettes uh, that uh, placed her here in the sarcophagus next to her husband. And inside, at the, uh, at the head of her sarcophagus, is standing in a stanchion the suffragette flag. Uh, and uh, this is uh, such a striking uh, uh, replica, and I can attest to that because in 1968, I, for the very first time, I went to France. I went to the, uh, the Chapel of Amboise in the Loire Valley, and I had forgotten that I had seen it here, and I had saw this, and I, got, and I shook all over because I had this feeling of deja vu. I had been here before, but I had never been in France before in my life until yeah. so it finally hit me that I had seen it in Woodlawn Cemetery, and so here it is. Uh, and I can attest to you, it's the exact replica of it in size, shape, and detail. Wow. And uh, it is used by Woodlawn Cemetery quite often in their advertising. Well, here we are at the mausoleum of Victor Herbert. Uh, Victor Herbert in the 19th century, late 19th century, uh, started out uh, musically as a, uh, uh, a man who played the cello. But he's most famous for a person who uh, composed music for and wrote and produced uh, operettas in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. Perhaps the, uh, the, the most best loved of his operettas is Babes in Toyland. Um, and uh, he had also something to do with the movies in the sense that in the 1930s, uh, there was a, a motion picture that was produced about his life. It's a motion picture biography, and it's called The Great Victor Herbert. Wow. Uh, here is the grave of the great Burt Williams. Uh, Burt Williams was a, uh, a black man who was born in Jamaica and then came to the United States became a vaudeville star. He could sing, he could dance, he could do magic tricks, uh, and he became the first black star of the Ziegfeld Follies. Um, and he made thousands of people laugh. Uh, the interesting thing is that even though he was a black man, he had to perform in blackface, uh, which was uh, what everybody did who imitated black people at the time. So he's a black man imitating himself. Um, he had a very good friend, uh, uh, W.C. Fields, and uh, W.C. Fields said, it's a funny thing about Burt Williams, he made thousands of people laugh, but he was the saddest person I know. Uh, it was, I guess, because of the things he had to do in order to take a living. And even then, when he had to travel, because of uh, segregation at the time, uh, when he went into a hotel, he had to use the uh, freight elevator in order to get to his hotel room. Uh, so even though he was world famous, that was okay. Now, he also had a part in the movies. Um, 
Uh, there are a series of shorts, uh, silent shorts, made by the Biograph Studios after D.W. Griffith had left uh, the Biograph Studios uh, that show Bert Williams doing some of his magic tricks. And so, uh, uh, yeah, in a sense, here he is, uh, uh, one of the great stars of the stage, also immortalized in film. Now we're at the grave of a fellow identified as William Barclay Masterson. And uh, when I tell you what he was called by his friends, uh, you might wonder what he is doing in a cemetery uh, in the Bronx in New York City. William Barclay Masterson was known as Bat, Bat Masterson. Uh, he is uh, probably best known as a, uh, a lawman out west. He was a scout for the United States Army. Uh, he was a friend of Wyatt Earp. Uh, and... Uh, uh, in later life, uh, he moved to New York City and became a reporter, a sports reporter for a New York City newspaper. And when he died, interestingly enough, he died at his desk typing. So, <laughs> in a sense, we know what his last words were because he typed them out. Uh, in any event, um, his friends buried him here. Now, uh, while he himself uh, was never in the movies... Uh, as a character, he does appear in films played by other actors. Um, and uh, you find him in any uh, film that has to do with Wyatt Earp as, as his friend. Uh, now, uh, many people uh, of a certain age would remember a television series called Bat Masterson, uh, where he was played by Gene Barry. Uh, that was on for several years. Uh, where uh, the character wore a derby and a walking cane. Uh, well, the real Bat Masterson never had a walking cane, but he always wore a derby. In any event, uh, here he is, uh, a Western lawman, a, uh, you know, part of American history, uh, that, and has been portrayed many times in films right here in Woodlawn Cemetery. Uh, we're at the part of Woodlawn Cemetery that has become a center for people who are connected with jazz and some of the great jazz greats. Uh, one of these is Miles Davis, who uh, uh, was a great trumpeter, but not only that, uh, but also uh, created uh, fusion jazz. Uh, now, you notice that on his very shiny monument, it says Sir Miles Davis, and that's only because he was a Knight of Malta. And uh, so he insisted on putting it there. Now, the interesting thing is that he is here in this location of the cemetery, along with the other jazz greats, because of the guy just across the road from him. Uh, and uh, that guy uh, was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, his name was Edward Kennedy Ellington, but he's better known by his nickname, Duke. Uh, and his entire family is here, Duke Ellington. Uh, and of course, uh, he is known for the quality of his jazz music. Um, that includes Mood Indigo, uh, Sophisticated Ladies, and uh, uh, other pieces. Late in life, of course, he also uh, uh, began to write uh, religious music. And so you have a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, two crosses uh, on his plot uh, with the words Ellington below to mark the family plot and his uh, mother, his father and uh, his sisters uh, are all here as well as he uh, and because of the existence of here uh, his existence here uh, a lot of jazz people uh, decided to come here and you have a whole uh, area that is filled with some jazz greats one of whom is of course the, uh, across the road from uh, Duke Ellington on the other side and uh, here you have uh, Lionel Hampton. Uh, Lionel Hampton of course uh, from the uh, big band era. Um, uh, vibraphone. vibraphone. He was a vibraphonist and uh, uh, this is uh, his final resting place. I think it's it, interesting enough that under the Hampton name under the main uh, stone it says flying home. Um, now, very near uh, Duke Ellington and Miles Davis uh, is the uh, grave of uh, Illinois Jacquet, uh, Jean-Baptiste Jacquet. Uh, he was very well known as a, uh, a saxophonist uh, and played in several bands and eventually wound up with a band of his own in the big band era. Um, uh, when he died and uh, his uh, gravestone was unveiled, there was a jazz band that was here 
that uh, you know, that played uh, jazz pieces, and there were about 200 people in the audience sitting down watching it, and uh, so he had a real jazz man's kickoff. <laughs> Uh, now, one of the jazz greats that's uh, buried on the hill that is, uh, overlooks the, uh, the final resting place of Duke Ellington uh, is Max Roach, who was uh, very well known as a drummer and uh, well-connected um, and an impresario in many ways. And uh, here he is with his uh, full name on his, uh, on his gravestone. Uh, and, of course, the dates of his birth and death, 1924 and 2007. Uh, we're in the uh, at the spot where Celia Cruz was buried, uh, the Queen of Salsa. Many right. people may know her as. It means a lot to me, so I'm a little for clam, so I'm going <laughs> to give you the microphone. Well, if we're talking about Celia Cruz, of course, uh, as you mentioned, she is the Queen of Salsa. But one of her trademarks is that uh, when she finished uh, one of her songs uh, and, and finished the show, uh, she would always shout out, Azúcar! Uh, which, of course, in Spanish means sugar. And uh, it was one of her trademarks and uh, that made her famous. And here she is, uh, uh, you know, after she passed away, uh, she was uh, buried right here in a mausoleum in Woodlawn Cemetery, and it bears her full name. And I can't tell you how many people uh, of uh, Latino origin uh, make a trek to Woodlawn Cemetery just to be here at her uh, mausoleum. Yeah, I would say also she was uh, very famous the world over. Right. Uh, she, I'm not sure she actually crossed over with the American public, no, no. but uh, but known the world over. Uh, you know, just an, an astounding talent. And I, if you don't know her music, please download some of her stuff today. You're going to love it. So, uh, we are at the grave site of the uh, of Irving Berlin, uh, America's uh, songster. Uh, he wrote over 1,000 songs. Uh, many of them are uh, standards today. And, of course, the outstanding ones are uh, uh, White Christmas, uh, Easter Parade, and God Bless America. Uh, he started out as a uh, performer. He was an immigrant, by the way. He was born in uh, Tsarist Russia and came here as a young kid. His re real name was uh, uh, Baleen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that, of course, metamorphosed into Berlin. Uh, he started out uh, basically as a singing waiter in Coney Island and uh, then became a performer um, and started writing songs. Interestingly enough, Irving Berlin, along with Victor Herbert and a few other people, uh, are the ones who met in Luchow's restaurant in, uh, uh, on the 14th Street in Manhattan to found ASCAP, uh, which was founded basically to protect the, uh, uh, the copyright rights of composers. Uh, so two of the, uh, the founding members of ASCAP are right here in Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, he wrote several, uh, several musicals uh, as well as individual songs. Um, uh, it, to, to name them would take forever. Um, but the, uh, uh, he also went to Hollywood and uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, screenplays, uh, 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 music for screenplays. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the most famous is uh, Top Hat. Uh, found, that starred uh, uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and the entire score is just one hit right after the other. Um, uh, later, he came back to Broadway and uh, uh, and uh, wrote uh, 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 "Annie Get Your Gun" and "Call Me Madam," and uh, they also have uh, standards uh, that are there. Um, the uh, interesting thing is that. God Bless America, he wrote during World War I for a show, and he didn't particularly think, thought it fit in the show, so he took it out. But he kept it as a, uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his file cabinet. And in 1938, Kate Smith, the uh, famous song, uh, songster, uh, came and said, Irving, do you have anything for me? And he went through his file cabinet, and he says, well, you think this would do? And uh, she looked at it and said, yeah, I think so. And then uh, she went on her radio show and sang it. And immediately it took over and uh, became something like the second national anthem of the United States. Uh, 
By that time, of course, the uh, uh, the Star Spangled Banner had been the national anthem for seven years officially. Um, so it is still played uh, and on patriotic occasions today. Interestingly enough, um, because he was the founder of ASCAP and very jealous of his copyright rights, all of his songs except one uh, he kept the copyright to, and uh, even today, as long as the copyright exists, it goes to uh, the money goes to his estate. The one that he gave away was "God Bless America," and he gave it to the Boy Scouts. And so every time God Bless America is played, and as long as the copyright lasts, the Boy Scouts of America get the, uh, get the money for it. Uh, we're at the, uh, the Cary Mausoleum, and uh, one of the members of the family that's buried here is Harry Cary, who was a silent film star in westerns and actually survived into the sound era. And at one point he actually made a, uh, a film uh, in which he appeared along with his son, Harry Carey Jr., uh, and uh, John Wayne was the star of the film. Um, now, Harry Carey does have another connection with the Bronx besides uh, being uh, buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. At one point in his life, he actually lived on City Island, which is in the Bronx. So uh, here he is now, a permanent Bronxite. Uh, we're in front of the mausoleum of the uh, George M. Cohan, um, one of the great uh, composers and performers um, in American history. Um, he did you know, dozens of uh, Broadway musicals uh, and performed on the vaudeville stage, uh, first with his family and, um, and then also all alone. Uh, there's inter some interesting things about George M. Cohan. Uh, first of all, he was very patriotic. He always claimed that he was born on the 4th of July. Uh, and uh, one of the f songs that he uh, composed was uh, Your Grand Old Flag, but he also composed Over There, which is probably the best war song ever, uh, 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 ever composed. Uh, the, um, the interesting thing here is that along with Irving Berlin, George M. Cohan and, uh, were the, uh, and Irving Berlin were the only composers ever to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for the patriotic songs that they wrote. Uh, in those days, that was before the Medal of Freedom was set aside for civilians, and the only award they had was the Congressional Medal of Honor, and here they are both in Woodlawn Cemetery. Now, George M. Cohan did appear in a film. Uh, and it was a, uh, a film with, of all people, Jimmy Durante. And to show you how old this film is, uh, Jimmy Durante had hair. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and he danced uh, in that film. And so you could actually see him perform uh, in many ways. Uh, now, he passed away soon afterwards, and then Hollywood made the big uh, blockbuster film uh, about the life of George M. Cohan, uh, starring uh, James Cagney. And interestingly enough, the dances that James Cagney performs in that film are exactly the same as the dances that George M. Cohan performed in his film as well. So here we are in, with one of the greatest performers and composers uh, uh, in America and in show business, uh, George M. Cohan. Interestingly enough, in business, George M. Co Cohan was a partner with a fellow by the name of Lou Harris. Uh, they never had a contract. All they had was a handshake. And uh, they, um, they respected each other. They worked well together. And interestingly enough, the next mausoleum over is the mausoleum of Lou Harris, his partner. Um, this is the memorial to uh, Irene and Vernon Castle. Before World War I, they were uh, in show business on the stage uh, as a dance team, uh, and they were the premier dance team of their day. Uh, so much were they admired that when uh, Irene Castle cut her long hair into a bob, uh, millions of women around the United States and the rest of the world followed, and it was known as the Castle Bob. Um, they had a, a dance that was called the Castle Walk. Um, now, what happened was that uh, uh, Vernon volunteered 
uh, for service in World War I. And uh, he uh, unfortunately was killed in World War I. He was uh, given the, uh, uh, the French uh, Medal of the Croix de Guerre. And uh, this monument was erected by Irene Castle in his honor, uh, showing a very sad, uh, nude woman uh, uh, mourning uh, his death. It is called the end of day. Uh, now, uh, Irene died uh, many decades later. And uh, the interesting thing about uh, Irene and Vernon Castle is that in the 1930s, there was a movie starring uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers in which they portrayed uh, the, the, the dancing couple, and it was called The Story of Irene and Vernon Castle. A number of, uh, of memorials uh, for the people who uh, died on the Titanic and who survived the Titanic, the Anna Bliss Memorial, uh, is a huge uh, uh, statue uh, that uh, does mark the spot and uh, commemorates uh, that great disaster. Uh, this is the mausoleum of uh, Marilyn Miller, who was a, uh, a star of the Ziegfeld Follies. Um, she um, was a dancer and uh, very beautiful. Um, she died, however, in 1936 at a comparatively young age. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was a Technicolor film biography of her uh, that was made, if I remember correctly, somewhere around the late 1940s or early 1950s. So uh, there is the story of her life that is commemorated in film.